Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 53. We are covering the savage, the sensational, the incredible She-Hulk. Thanks to our patron Ruby for this uh, fantastic suggestion. And I am absolutely loving this character. And it's a character that I've been wanting to talk about for for a very long time as an attorney. Uh, Characters like Jen and, and Matt Murdock definitely appeal to me. And rightfully so, because they still don't hold a candle to you as an attorney, but... Oh, please. Oh, please. They could wipe the floor with me, legally speaking. Not to mention they could whoop my ass six ways from Sunday. But before we get into Jen as a character, just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes. Um, Want to give a congratulations to Brian Burley from Marvel Mythos. He won a the signed copy of 12 Devils Dancing. Uh, thanks to Erica Schultz, who we did uh, last week. We had the fantastic guest interview. Thank you again, Erica, for that amazing interview. So that copy will be going out to Brian. And the video is on Instagram of the live drawing. So you can see it was completely at random. But I'm going to segue into what I'm going to say next may sound like it was favorite but I swear to God, it was completely random. I will be doing a guest spot on the Marvel Mythos podcast in an upcoming episode to discuss the Spider-Man Web of Death storyline. I swear on the graves of my grandparents that it was completely unrelated and this was not, oh, hey, thanks for getting me on the show. Here's the signed book. I swear it was legit. I went to a randomizer website and it took care of everything. So it's not my fault. I I do just want to make that perfectly clear. And I'd like to think you're swearing on your grandparents' graves because you liked them. Yes. Okay. Yes, I love them and miss them terribly. Another thing we are going to be doing, well, we slash or or just Doc, more likely just Doc, is going to be doing a guest spot on Project Guardians uh, upcoming. So we'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Goku about uh, comic book characters. I don't know who it is that you're going to talk about yet, but you guys can sort that out and that will be on an upcoming episode. Uh, quick shout outs to Collateral Gaming for being an awesome Twitter friend. So you can check them out. They are fantastic. That is, if you are into gaming and podcasts, which if you're listening to this podcast, which is about psychiatry and comic books, I feel like you're enough of a nerd that you're probably also a video game player. And I say that with love. I really don't say that in a detrimental fashion. That's not an insult. I am a gamer. Doc is a gamer. We love video games. So if you love video games, and again, since you're listening to this podcast, there's a really good chance you're also into video games. Check out Collateral Gaming. It's a highly entertaining show. And last, I want to give a shout out and thank you to Pod Sound School for giving us an audit on uh, their Facebook page. We recently signed up for this group and they basically went through, they listened to the show, they dissected the content, they dissected us from a technical standpoint, they looked at our social media pages and they gave a lot of very helpful tips. So hopefully this show sounds a little better, sounds a little cleaner and maybe just as well as content wise that we can just make those little tweaks and improvements. And definitely on the social media stuff, I there were a lot of very helpful suggestions that they made related to the website, um, particularly the links that are in our show notes that are that work fine on our website, but don't work well from, say, Spotify or other apps. That is a, a distributor thing. I'm gonna have to have a check with Libsyn and see why it is that the links aren't working like they should, because they do work on our website. If you go to capesonthecouch.live and you listen to our show that way, the show notes, clearly the links work on the show notes. Unfortunately, they don't always translate over to the app. And I'm working to try and see if I can make that happen. That was something I didn't know, honestly. Well, I'm glad that they gave so many good examples of things we could do better from an audio standpoint. Thanks. Thanks for that. So stick around because uh, towards the end of the show, we have a couple of uh, surprise announcements and we have a surprise guest for this week's skit. So let's just jump right into it. She-Hulk created by Stan Lee and John Bashima in the Savage She-Hulk number one, February 1980. Side note, I always thought She-Hulk was created a little earlier than that. I wasn't realized. I didn't realize that it was as late as 1980. Yeah, that's pretty much our lifetime, really. 
That's impressive. Yeah, so she was actually created as a character to prevent anyone else from having the rights to a female version of the Hulk because they saw what happened on the TV show The Six Million Dollar Man, and then they created the Bionic Woman. And apparently there was also a Benny Hill skit that may have featured a female version of the Hulk, and they said, oh, geez, if they create this female version of the character, we may not have the rights to it. So Stan Lee and John Bushima wrote and and drew the first issue, and then it was handed off, but at least, and this was actually, I believe, the last character that Stan Lee created for Marvel for almost 20 years before he came back to the company. But in any case, Jen Walters is a lawyer and cousin of Bruce Banner. She was shot by goons of a crime boss that she was making a case against, and Bruce, who happened to be visiting her when he was shot, he gave her a blood transfusion to save her life, and his blood naturally contains all the gamma-radiated molecules because science that's how it works in comics and so she ends up in the hospital recovering the mobsters come to the hospital to finish her off she rages out and becomes a she-hulk and that name was sort of given to her by the mobsters they're like oh she's some sort of a she-hulk and she said yeah i guess i am a she-hulk yeah more than likely this would have produced some sort of transfusion reaction and she more than likely would have died fairly quickly just way to just ruin the parade. Way to just piss right in the cereal. Oh, well. But in any case, Jen Walters is very shy and timid, but she comes to embrace the She-Hulk form and she prefers the confidence that it gives her over her normal look. And she joins a lot of uh, the superhero team. She becomes a hero in her own right. She at one point joins the Fantastic Four to replace a temporarily depowered thing. And during this time, she gets exposed to radiation. That means she could never return to her human form. This was later revealed to not be the case, and it was more psychosomatic, that she could not become Jen Walters again. Then later on, thanks to a hex from the Scarlet Witch, Jen goes mad and ends up destroying an Idaho town in a fight with Bruce, who gets blamed for all of the damage. Then she joins a prestigious law firm, uh, Goodman, Lieber, Kurtzberg, and Holloway. Goodman, Lieber, and Kurtzberg are the names of the founders the real uh, icons of Marvel Comics. Uh, Martin Goodman was was the first publisher. Uh, Lieber is Stan Lee's real last name, Stan Lee Lieber, and Kurtzberg was Jack Kirby's real last name. So that was a nice little nod to the pioneers of Marvel Comics. But the law firm hires her as Jen Walters, not She-Hulk. So she reluctantly agrees to remain human while working for the firm, and she starts this sort of relationship with a co-worker, Augustus Pugliese, a.k.a. Pug. She gets disbarred after a client that she defended for murder, confessed that he was guilty and showed photos, which led to her hulking out and attacking him and revealing some privileged information. And as an attorney, I can tell you that's a big no-no. Right. You definitely do not reveal privileged information like that. Uh, in public. Yeah, the medical equivalent would be a HIPAA violation. Yeah, absolutely. And she joins the Future Foundation uh, for a time. So Jen slash She-Hulk has been in a lot of, she's been on a lot of teams. There have been a lot of very interesting runs. And I know one of the, the questions that Ruby had was not really so much related to Jen as a character, but more asking which runs should she read? Which runs should she really get interested in? I will say that there was a run in the mid 80s, the John Byrne run that established that Jen is like a slightly less manic Deadpool in the sense that Jen can break the fourth wall. Jen is fully aware that she is in a comic book. And particularly in that 80s run, it's done with a lot of tongue in cheek references. And then the Dan Slot run is a, a favorite of mine. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that run. The artwork on that is really great. I, f- I forget the artist's name off the top of my head. I should have written it down, but I, I was doing a lot of reading of She-Hulk to, to research for this episode. And the name eludes me. But what I what I find interesting about it is just the way that he draws faces. Her face is very round and she almost appears pudgy in the face. It's cute but it's it's very rounded are you trying to describe the things that you find attractive in she-hulk no Uh, first off i just want to say she-hulk is hot i'm not even trying to dispute that but the point is that what i found very interesting from an artistic standpoint was that she-hulk is this massive amazonian warrior and yet she's drawn with these very soft features facially speaking. So I just found it very interesting that that from an artistic standpoint that she wasn't given the, you know, her body obviously is very muscular and curvy and so on and so forth, but her face was very soft. Contrast that with the um, the Polito run, the Javier Polito art on the Charles Soule 
written run from, I think, 2014, 2015, which I, I love. It's 12 issues. It's fantastic. I have it signed by Charles Soule, all 12 issues. I have it signed by Kevin Wawa or Wada, who did the covers for all 12 issues. Fantastic. I really love that series because Charles Soule is an attorney. And I love when he also write, uh, writes Daredevil or, or wrote Daredevil for a time. And I love anything that he writes with characters that are attorneys because the law takes such a step forward in terms of how it's represented. Whereas during the Dan Slot run, it was, well, the law is just sort of this amorphous thing and there's some research in there. But when Charles Soule was writing She-Hulk, the law really came to the forefront. But what I was saying was uh, Javier Polito's style is much more angular. Okay. And he also made Jen look very attractive, but Jen almost looked... <sighs> Dare I say a Greek or Italian? And what I mean by that is, and I can say this as an Italian married to a Greek, the Roman nose, so to speak, the very sharp, angular, prominent nose. Whereas in the slot run, it was much more of a, of a soft feature. The, the nose wasn't nearly as prominent. So it was just artistic license taken with the, the facial features of Jen Walters so vary how, from time to time. So how long have you disliked your nose? Ah, uh, that's you. You cut deep there because, you know, you from high school, you remember those days. It's not even that. I'm saying this as a mental health professional. If you're going to lay information like that in that fashion, I'm going to pick up on the underlying subtext. I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. But my point is that not that I dislike my nose. I've come to appreciate my nose, but it is a larger feature on my face. And when Javier Polito was drawing Jen, it had much more prominence than it did in some of the other runs. And again, just the, the sharper features that, that he drew. And again, not unattractive, but I digress. We're not in here to talk about how attractive, how hot Jen is. Let's talk about her as a character. And so the first issue that I want to address, and this is something that goes back to the very beginning of the, the run back in the, the 80s run, that she's uncomfortable in her own skin as Jen Walters. She's much more comfortable as She-Hulk, and she prefers to walk around as She-Hulk because she considers Jen weak. That is something that I know we've talked, uh, we've done a couple of characters that have the, the dual personalities and so on and so forth, but to contrast her with her cousin, say, and we did the entire episode with Popcorn Psychology on The Incredible Hulk, Bruce is more afraid of the Hulk, and the Hulk considers Banner as this puny weakling, and there's a dislike there. With Jen, it's not a dislike. It's a distaste or a discomfort being Jen. She can change back to Jen, but she prefers being green. So for, for She-Hulk, it is, in fact, easy being green, despite what Kermit the Frog would have you believe. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean in terms of she has these two very clear facets of her personality and she strongly prefers one versus the other? To relate it to most people in life, there comes a time through multiple experiences where you know what your strengths are. So for Jen, as She-Hulk, she physically and emotionally and mentally gets to tap into the best of herself or what she considers to be the best of herself. And I think it's fair to say that most of us would like to think that we can be our best selves at all times. So she happens to have this physical manifestation and that allows her to let the world know that this is her best version of herself. But that also raises a question. If you are always saying that one particular view is your best self, what happens if you consider yourself in a situation that you're using, quote unquote, your weaker traits? I'm not talking about physically weak. I'm talking about things that either you're uncomfortable with or things that you think are a flaw and it's going to be exposed if you aren't who you want to be. So for someone like She-Hulk, if she reverts to Jen, that automatically means she's lost something. Either someone has put her in a position where she doesn't think She-Hulk is the right person and maybe she wants to be ignored, or it could simply be that 
She wants to present something almost as a diversion. Don't worry about me right now. I'll be back to She-Hulk as soon as I'm good and ready. Well, I, want to, I just want to interject real fast Go because I noticed the phrase that you used, revert to Jen. Mm. Not, not change into Jen, mm. not transfer to Jen. The, the very notion that we are referring to it as reverting to Jen indicates that She-Hulk becomes almost the default and that Jen is the aberration, whereas Jen was theoretically the original Right. So right. I, so I maybe, maybe it's coming from that point that Jen was yeah. the original and she is. So she's reverting back to her original form. But just I don't know, just for me, that's guess, a good point. You know, language being descriptive. Yes. To it to an extent that if you thoughts thoughts are only as clear as the language we use to describe them. Right. And so if you use a phrase like revert, that carries with it the underlying implication. And it does in this case, because. Although the situations that led to the development of She-Hulk were outside of Jen's control, at this point, we've established that this is a choice. She has the ability at certain times to either be, quote unquote, She-Hulk or be, quote unquote, Jen. And you, as a much more avid reader of her runs, I can defer to you on this. How is that balance? How often is she Jen? How often is she She-Hulk? Oh, she's almost overwhelmingly She-Hulk. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's very rare that she's Jen for an extended period of time. And she likens it to when she comes home and she can or when she can become She-Hulk again, she likens it to coming home and taking your shoes off mm. or changing out of your suit for the day because it's just for her a mental standpoint, it is the form that she is most comfortable with. And so I think, you know, to, to tie in and not to, to cut you off or to try to speak on your behalf, but uh, I think a lot of folks understand what it's like to be on for right. for a time, that it, especially if you're a job, if you're in sales, whatever, right. or if you are a job where you have to be out in public, you have to be on. Right. And it's draining to be on. Right. And so you don't want to be on all the time. For Jen, ironically, being Jen Walters is being on. Right. Being She-Hulk is the, okay, I could just be me. I can I can be free. Yeah. Relaxed form of her. Right. And I appreciate the fact that I'd say especially over the past decade in general, society has come to a greater appreciation of having that downtime, of having that release from, as you described it, being on. But at the same time, it should be duly noted that there is a reason why being on exists, why having that ability to adapt and adjust the efforts of your social interactions, your emotional responses and your other acumen for certain situations, why those things shift over time and to just completely ignore that puts you at a disadvantage, in my opinion, because you're not sharpening all of your tools in your toolbox. You're not giving yourself the opportunity to develop other skills that may be beneficial, even if you want to consider, for She-Hulk's case, her green side is her best side. That's fine. But at some points, it's nice to get input from the gen side, because it'll allow her to have another perspective on certain situations that she may not have otherwise or come up with ideas. Creativity often stems from situations where you least expect it because you gave yourself different circumstances. The Creativity comes from limitations. Right. So, yes, I know as a personal example, I would love the idea of just being at home doing things when I randomly want to do them on much less of a schedule and much less of a hectic nature and things like that. I still make sure that I go to work every day because I know for a fact if I didn't, I would languish so much in my own natural state that I would not be nearly as productive in helping people. So I'm honest with Truth. myself. I'm honest with myself about that. And She-Hulk, in a strange way, although she is honest with what she wants she's not honest with what she needs to be 
So if she allowed some form of shifting dynamic and balance where sometimes, scary thought, she was Jen more often than she was She-Hulk, she might come to appreciate the parts of her that she considers to be inferior, weak, or less useful, and realize that that means she has great potential for those areas to improve over time. And it doesn't just have to be one way, the green way. Fair enough. So the next thing that I want to talk about is, and and it's sort of like a two-parter. So we'll, we'll get into the, the first part of this because they're, they're, I guess, two sides of a very similar coin. Her relationships tend to be short-term, which is not inherently bad in and of itself. Jen is one of the more, I would say, proudly sexual female characters in not just the Marvel Universe, but in comics in general, that Jen is very comfortable, not just in her skin, but in her sexuality, in who she is. And she understands that and she appreciates it and she has fun and she makes no excuses for it, nor should she. But having said that, it means that she tends to avoid some stronger connections. And this was a big thing during the Dan Slot run in particular, where at one point uh, she got kicked out of the Avengers mansion because she was bringing home so many one night stands that it was becoming a detriment to the security clearances. And she was also partying so much, it was causing damage to the mansion. Because if you can imagine what a seven ton sev- uh, or a seven foot, several hundred pound Amazonian can party like, it's it's you know can create some structural deficiencies. So she tends to to just have a lot of one night stands, and this came back to bite her because the one model that she was uh, sleeping with left her or or didn't want to sleep with her anymore because he said that he was looking for someone with more depth, and that came as a really shock to her. So this, as I said, now she has had experiences with long term relationships. She was married. Um, to John Jameson, uh, J. Jonah Jameson's son. She was engaged to White Wingfoot. She was in a long-term relationship with Star Fox, not the R-Wing flying Fox character. Oh, man, can't do a barrel roll. Dim dibbit, dim dibbit. No, actually Thanos' brother. But in any case, it later turned out that he was using his pheromone powers to basically convince her to fall in love with him. It was a whole thing. The point is she can have the long-term relationships, but she really tends to just stay fleeting in the moment. And that can create some, some problems because you can't live life just on a shallow perspective. As a human being, we we tend to thrive when we have at least one deep connection. And Jen has difficulty with that. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I was listening to a completely unrelated podcast. It was actually more on finance. Anybody that knows me knows that's not surprising. But was it Stacking Benjamins? No, it wasn't. It was a completely different one. But And I honestly don't remember which one it was because this was a few months ago. But the point was sometimes the, the spice and flavor of life are some of the shallow contacts. What I mean by that is if you have a routine of always going, let's say, to your favorite uh, corner store or you go to your comic book shop and you happen to know people there, you may or may not know every detail about their life, but the familiarity of your routine and what you say every day and you, you know, exchange pleasantries, all of that, it makes the day more tolerable, enjoyable even. Unfortunately, though, that's not something that is sustainable. In other words, it works in the moment, but it doesn't seem to last longer than that. And so what you end up doing is you end up chasing a high similar to any other addiction. So with someone like She-Hulk, I'm not saying that she ends up going through withdrawals or or fiending for things or, or anything of the sort. It's just simply that she ends up experiencing often that new surge of hormones and emotion related to new contacts more frequently than many other people do. And that is exhilarating, clearly. That's enjoyable. But it also can lead to burnout. So we may not think of a seven-foot, several hundred-pound Amazonian woman as burning out, but the point remains that at some point, even if she doesn't notice it, everyone around her will. And everyone around her has at times. 
if she's not ready to understand why people would have concerns or deal with the consequences as to why people are starting to shut her out, because that's another possibility. If she's not ready for any of that, that can lead to emotional distress. So it's nice that she is able to enjoy the company of different people in many different circumstances, but that doesn't mean that when those other people may want something different than what she is looking for, she'll be able to quote unquote, take that next step because it's nice to say that when the time comes, I'll be ready. But as most of us, I think, realize there's no such thing. You don't get the perfect time, the perfect opportunity automatically. It may happen. I'm not saying it doesn't. It may happen. But more often, what I've observed in my career is that people have developed relationships because they were willing to look at the total package of what people are and accept all of it together and through the relationship sort out what things were at any given moment. Sometimes that's uncomfortable. Sometimes that's challenging. Sometimes it's arduous and takes a long time. It's not something that happens as a snapshot. The best way I could describe it is she looks at her relationships as a painting and you appreciate its, its composition. You appreciate its beauty. And for whatever reason, she doesn't want to look at the entire film. So you're going to miss a lot if you put everything in that lens. Yeah. And going back to your earlier point uh, with regard to to relationships, there's the the honeymoon phase, mm-hmm. the very early on stage. And that's all. Mm-hmm. It's fun. It's fresh. It's exciting. A lot of us have been there. A lot of us know what that's like when it's fun and you can't get enough of the other person and you're texting everybody. And then the relationship evolves and it changes. You know, I've been with my wife now for over four years. We've been married almost three. And yeah, our relationship is very different now than it was in the beginning. And I have a a friend of mine who's in that new, fun, exciting stage. And I listened to him talk about his girlfriend and just how he's over the moon and it's so much fun. And and I'm so happy for him because I remember that feeling. And I said, it's great. And I, I kind of miss it to some extent because mm. it is fun. It is exciting. Mm. And I'm not saying that I don't love my wife or that anything <laughs> else. But my point is that it's, it's a different kind of love. It's a deeper love. It's a stronger love that I have for my wife now than we did when we first started dating. We're married and we have a kid and a house and all these other things. So it's a different kind of relationship, but it doesn't mean that I love her any less. It does mean that I love her differently. But as long as you're OK with that and you're willing to accept it, that's that's the important thing. Yeah, I'm not going to try and use psychiatric terms with this, but I think our entire audience will relate to this. If you've ever been in that type of long term relationship, I'm not necessarily saying marriage or, or automatically putting it in some institution. But if you've experienced that type of transition, as you described it, when you read comics or when you read books or you watch movies or TV shows and there are certain characters and you're wondering, will they, won't they? Or they're in that honeymoon phase, as you described it, all those things. Sometimes I think that's the most visceral and and wonderful part of media. I think it's something that everyone that's ever had that type of relationship can can really latch on to. I can watch something that I think is the most trite, useless, ridiculous stuff. But if two characters, for whatever reason, seem to have that spark, I actually get interested for like out of nowhere. (laughs) I don't know. That's just I know it's an aside. And like I said, I'm not putting any psychiatric terms to it. I just think that that's one of the things that a character like Jen has some glimpses of that. But it doesn't seem to ever reach that point, in my opinion, at least because I, I don't read direct She-Hulk runs. I've only had the experience with the character in other runs of things I've read. And I always get this feeling like she could be that type of character if she let herself. And there's always this 
veer off at the end where she just won't let that happen. And I think that's a shame. Yeah. So tying in with that is the notion that, and it just goes to Jen at her core, she very much lives in the moment, which is all, again, fun and games, but it creates problems if she has to plan long term. And I'm going to pull a quote from uh, issue number two of the Charles Soule run, where she's she's talking to Patsy Walker, Hellcat, uh, if you watch Jessica Jones's Trish in the comic form, when Jen quits her job at a, a high profile firm because they wanted her as She-Hulk to bring in their bring in her her superhero friends as clients. And she wasn't doing that enough because she said these relationships are sacred to me and I'm not just going to abuse them so that you can make money off of them. So she quits slash gets fired. It's one of those, you know, you're fired. Well, I quit. Screw you, whatever. So she leaves and now she's trying to come up with money. And Patsy says, you've been a hot shot attorney for years. Why haven't you saved anything? And she says, I never save this life. What's the point? There's always something crazy right around the corner. Planning too far ahead is just asking for disappointment. I just want to do the best I can at everything while I can. I think that as a just a little quote is such a perfect summation of who Jen is as a character that she has this drive to just be the best at everything in the moment right then and there tomorrow be damned and again it's it leads to a very fun and free spirited character but in situations like this you can't live in the moment all of the time because you have to interact with people and you have to have relationships that evolve over time. And this goes back to the the honeymoon phase that, yeah, if you're just looking for the short term thing, you can live in the moment because you don't have to worry about it. And if things go sour, well, whatever. No, you know, it's no sweat off my back. But at some point, the, the human condition kicks in and you need that long term relationship. You need that deeper relationship. And that requires planning. Yep. And for someone with Jen's mindset, that's very difficult to grasp. And go. (laughs) Your turn. Well, to be honest with you, I think Jen, in this case, is pretty spot on with humanity as a whole. The way we go through our regular lives in many different facets, unfortunately, because I've actually had people say to me, well, what's the point of planning if things are just going to change anyway? Well, that's why usually if we're being realistic and rational about things, we call it planning, not a plan, because there's always a plan. Having no plan is a plan. It's a horrible plan because it means you have no influence on things that you could have influence on. I find it ironic in that quote that it says, I just want to do the best I can at everything while I can. In what reality are we in that your best at any one thing means don't take time and effort to put forth the types of effort, energy, skill, repeated learning that you need over a certain period of time so that your response and your actions are better than they were on a previous occasion. That's the definition of being, quote unquote, the best. There used to be that, oh boy, I'm going to forget his name now. Uh, He ended up being credited with the claim that you need 10,000 hours of I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The 10,000 hour rule. Yeah. I mean, by the way, that's not exactly true, but that's not the point. The point is, yes, it does make a difference if you take a lot of time and effort and focus on one particular area and become very good at it. You'll definitely be better than if you took no time doing that at all. I know that sounds like common sense. And yet many of the day to day decisions that we make are in direct contradiction to it. I know for a fact that in order for you and I to have a better experience with Tough Mudder come October, Mm -hmm. I need to be running. I need to be working out. I need to be doing it consistently. I'm not ashamed to say that I am way behind on it. Ditto. So does that mean that because we love doing those things, the day that we show up because we love it and we want to be in the moment and when we get that initial 
burst of energy, we're going to feel great and it's going to be fantastic. You're lying if you say that we are the best that we could be in that moment. So I yeah, think when Sean <laughs> asks for our best that day, we're, we may have to give him our settled best because <laughs> we're not going to give <laughs> not, him our, our on, authentic, uh, uh, yeah, our, our honest, honest best. best. <laughs> Look up Sean Corvell and his Tough Mudder speeches. If you want to run through a mountain uh, after listening to Sean, I, he's he's the best. I'm just your mere man. I'm not your hype man. But anyway, <laughs> but the point stands as as stated i think you did a good job describing it yourself let alone needing a, a psychiatrist to point that out okay you don't need significant i i know i'm stammering here but i just want to point out whenever we talk about plans or planning it doesn't have to be complicated i think sometimes people get this paralysis by analysis because they think if they don't have everything perfectly set up ahead of time, that means they can't take any steps forward. They let perfection be the enemy of the good. Exactly. So I don't think that's Jen's situation, but I think that also can apply to many people and we want to help as many people as we can with this podcast. So the whole point is if you have a general direction that you want to go, it's a good idea to do some basic research on what it is that you're interested in. It's a good idea to then from there say, how can I do that? Because there's a few ways this can go for someone like She-Hulk. She can continue to just be in the moment. And I know it's comics, so they don't always age, but I'm going to bring it to humanity. You can do this for, I don't know, decades when you're young, it's OK. People even give you that excuse. You're young, you're inexperienced, you're going to gain your own experiences and you're probably going to learn better from those than if you just listen to other people. I think a lot of that is bunk because I know fully well I had older sisters. I avoided a lot of disasters in life because I saw other people's mistakes. So you don't always have to make them. Tangent aside, how long do you allow that to happen? I know you and I, we're almost in our 40s. I don't think people give us that much leeway anymore. Nope. We have too many responsibilities. We do too many things that are important to society at large. We can't just say, oh, well, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay, you know, come what may. No. If we make a mistake, we own it and we try and learn from it. But the point is, we actually have it down, similar to being audited for our podcast. We know what's wrong. We make corrections, and we try and do it a little better the next time. Jen's attitude could serve that way as well, but she's usually not presented that way. She's yeah. presented more as, okay, here we go again. I'm going to do as, you know, I'm going to go as hard as I can the same time I did last time with probably the same approach. And because I have good intentions, it's going to work out. Yeah. I I don't know. Life just doesn't at least in my experience and, and the experience of many of my patients and the experience of all the people around me and the world at large and tomes that have been around for centuries doesn't really work out that way. Nope, not so much. <laughs> so we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to get into treatment. So stick around. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Maddie. Do you like horror movies? I sure do. Well, did you know that most horror movies are inspired by real-life horror? Really? Like what? Well, take The Shining, for instance. That's based on Stephen King's real-life addictions, or The Purge, which could be our country any minute now. Oh, and The Strangers, which is based on a real-life murder. People should be talking about these things. Hey, Guys. Oh, oh, hey, Producer, producer Michael. Michael oh, well, I hate to break it to you, but somebody already is. It's you. <gasps> That's right. We are Friday the 13th, the podcast where we talk about horror in real life and horror in media, all from an LGBTQ perspective. Because we gay, y'all. We are proud members of the Legion Podcast Network, and we can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Come along with us on this crazy journey. And as always, get slayed. Have you ever been reading through a sack of comics and thought, maybe I should see what the Sarkham Asylum game is all about? Or been playing Marvel vs. Capcom and felt like you were at a real disadvantage since you didn't know who half the characters were? Well, Play Comics is the show for you. I'm Chris, and each episode we take a look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. So whether you know the comics and want to know how all these games work, or you know the games and want to find out where all this craziness came from, go check out Play Comics at playcomics.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. 
and we're back. So getting into the treatment section, starting as we always do with In Universe. Now, I will say that she has, at least in the, the dance slot run, she has met with your guy, Doc Samson. Yay. Uh, who obviously not only knows what it's like as a psychiatrist, but also can change into the Hulk. So he definitely understands the appeal of that raw power, nature, etc. So what would you say to Jen slash She-Hulk that Doc Samson wouldn't, given that she or, or that Doc can relate to her in the way that you can't? And and we, we did address this somewhat during the Incredible Hulk episode and, right. and the skit that we did there. Right, right. Well, first of all, without her trying to hit on me, uh, I think my focus would be a little different than what you would expect. We all know about empathy, meaning you're doing your best to put yourself in the other person's shoes and feel their emotions and how they're doing in a situation. I'm not necessarily looking to do that with She-Hulk. I need to acknowledge that I don't know. And I may not be trying to immediately empathize with her. She already has the comfort of feeling positive emotions when she's green. I need to get in touch with the potentially uncomfortable emotions as Jen. And I would do my best to more than likely make a request that any sessions we have she try and do them as Jen, because I think there's a lot more work there. And I think, ironically, Jen may have the tools, the proper mental mindset to allow She-Hulk to start doing some of the things that we think she's been lacking. Some of that long term planning, some of that uncomfortable vision of the future and looking at her intimate relationships in a deeper way. So I may get thrown out of the room. Like literally, I may get like hand, you know, manhandled and tossed out of the room. I don't know, but I'd be willing to take that chance because She-Hulk doesn't need to be a better superhero. She-Hulk needs to be better for herself. Fair enough. I really can't even argue with that. Um, so out of universe. Um, hmm. No, we don't have anybody that's green and an attorney. OK, so. No, I, what I was going to say is somebody who who needs to be on yeah. all of the time and is very uncomfortable with the real person. You know who uh, is a great analogy? Peter Sellers. Ooh, ooh. Peter Sellers, uh, the, the late great actor was so uncomfortable with who he really was that mm-hmm. he dove into roles and became those personas. Being there was basically supposed to be the role most like Peter Sellers in real life. That's why he fought so hard to play Chauncey Gardner, because he wanted to, uh, because he knew what that was like. Mm. Peter Sellers was a very um, misunderstood man who really was incredibly talented, but also very, almost cripplingly so, uncomfortable with who he really was. But as long as he was acting, he was fine. So, you know, that's that's interesting because I, I thought of a couple of other people. Johnny Carson was described that way. Ed McMahon described him as he was so incredibly comfortable with 10,000 people in an audience that you could you would be shocked at, at how horrified he was when he was with 10 So another example of someone who in the spotlight seemed to be this larger than life figure. But the second that that's a way he he just had so much difficulty keeping things together. And one that for our wrestling fans out there that I know you saw this documentary, Ric Flair, you know? Yeah. Or Richard Fleer. Richard Fleer. Yes. The man that basically at this point never really got to exist because of Ric Flair, you know, and I'm not going to give away everything about that. And and there's plenty you can read on him anyway. Woo! But no, the point is, as you said, people that have to be on and then are uncomfortable otherwise. This actually is, is fairly simple as a therapist, because most people try and keep that persona for a certain amount of time. And it's not my job to 
automatically come poking holes in that persona and trying to dig through heavily. You can do it if it's time intensive. In other words, the person has a busy schedule. They're not going to have much time. Then you have to lay it out to them point blank. If you want to improve, talk to me about some of the things that I'm going to ask you that are uncomfortable. If you don't want to do that, then by all means, I'll try and refer you to someone else that may be able to help. If we're talking about someone that's in a much less time intensive situation and we can stretch this out, not intentionally, just the nature of the situation, then you want to hear what the person's content is with relation to the people around them, because often they'll talk about the successes of how they've dealt with someone. In other words, it becomes a score sheet. They did well at their job because the company made such and such amount of money. They have a wife who does this, or they have a wife who looks like this, or they have friends who own this. They talk about it all in terms of that performance value, as opposed to yeah, I really love going out and having fun with etc. Or, you know, it was really nice that I was able to be there for their child's graduation. All the other intimate things that, for the most part, we would consider to be important. You have to do your best as a therapist to make that adjustment, make that switch over into what we consider to be the long lasting things that will allow for a greater enjoyment in life as opposed to the other things that people admire and continue to produce some level of attention, but emotionally don't seem to have as good a yield. And there's going to be some people, I think, that dispute this. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I think progress is great. I think people earning money and having fame and success. I think that's all wonderful. I'm not knocking any of it. I'm just saying that at least allow yourself to have the other positive experiences in life that will lead to greater fulfillment as opposed to automatically being one way or the other. In other words, there's a fear sometimes with people that are always on and have had success being always on that when they turn it off, for some reason, it's to the detriment of that other side. And that's definitely not the case. And it's it's a hard sell, a very hard sell. But if you can pierce that veil, if you can get through it, then often you end up being the model of what would be considered a close, successful and healthy relationship. And once the person, the client, the patient, whatever you want to call them, once that person realizes it and they're able to verbalize it with you and they understand it, then you may be able to transition, meaning, hey, if you're doing this well, maybe you can take some of these techniques and, and apply them directly to people that you know. It, it's it's a little scary to think that someone going through therapy becomes a therapist, but I can say firsthand that that is really how it works. So it's a wonderful experience if you if you ever go through it, I think. Obviously, Bringing up things that you're uncomfortable with is, is near torturous at times, but it's worth it. All right. Uh, well, I, I definitely understand the notion of going through therapy. You become a, a therapist just because I think if you're going through those kinds of experiences, then you end up with a better understanding of what the techniques are. And then you, you see them and then you can repeat them if you're paying attention, mind you, if you're actually taking the time to better yourself and not just going through life. So I, I think there is something to that. So very excellent points. Um, so now we're going to take all of this. And before we get into the skit, uh, we have a special guest voice playing the role of She-Hulk as I did not feel comfortable playing a, a female role. I just I, I get tired of it and I don't think I sound very good. So how and, long have you been intimidated by your attraction to She-Hulk? <sighs> The role of She-Hulk today in the skit will be played by my sister, Angela D'Alessandro. Uh, you can find her on Twitter and on Instagram at Ange D'Alessandro. So here we go. Uh, we get Jen Walters uh, interacting with Dr. Issues. Hello, Ms. Walters. I'm Dr. Issues. Nice to speak with you, Doc. You know, normally my patients come to my office so I can talk to them face to face. Yeah, 
Yeah, sorry about that. I got called into court at the last minute. You know judges can be a real pain. I understand. I'm just curious why you didn't want to reschedule. To be honest, Doc, trying to cram time into my life to sit down means I'd have to look ahead more than a few days. And that hasn't worked out for me in the past. So we made this appointment and I'm sticking to it, even if it's not in your office. Why do you feel planning hasn't worked out for you? How many superheroes do you know? I've worked with several. And how many lawyers do you know? My best friend, some people I went to school with, a few associates. So you know it's a pretty busy lifestyle. So try combining the two. That must wreak havoc on your social life. Actually, I've made it work. The trick is to keep things fun and easy. That way, when things inevitably go south, there's no real harm done. Wham, bam, thank you, man. Is that the feedback you've received from the people left in the wake of your She-Hulk tsunami? Most of them are gone by breakfast, so there's not a lot of feedback there. And the feedback I get beforehand, well, like I said, it's worked for all parties involved so far. Let me ask you, do you meet these people as Jen or as She-Hulk? Almost always She-Hulk. I spend the vast majority of my time as her, so it's how I meet most people. Plus, it attracts men way more than Jen ever does. So you're telling me that you've never wondered what it would be like for more than a one-night stand? I've had relationships before. I was married to John Jameson, worst father-in-law ever. I was engaged to Wyatt Wingfoot. I dated Star Fox. It didn't look so well in hindsight, but at the time it was good. So I can do long-term. It just has to work for everyone. Not to sound too condescending, but you realize that a long-term relationship is not going to happen by random chance. There's going to be some discomfort and extra effort. Have you actually tried to do that before? There was one guy, Zapper, when I was younger. I knew him for a long time before I was She-Hulk. It wasn't easy going back and forth, but we made it happen because he was a great guy. Until he decided he wanted Jen all the time. What's wrong with that? Jen can't get things done like She-Hulk can. Jen was great through law school, and I'm grateful that... You know what? I'm speaking about Jen like she's this other entity. I'm both Jen and She-Hulk. Not like my cousin, where it's the separate being. I know I'm Jen. I can just be more free when I'm green. So it's clear to me that you've created this artificial barrier for part of yourself, and yet you thanked her for the part that you consider to be useful. Is, is there a way to create more balance for yourself? I worked for a boss who hired Jen, not She-Hulk. And I worked for bosses who wanted She-Hulk, not Jen. So the balance is entirely up to what the situation requires. So what if the situation is you're by yourself or with someone you care about? I mean, that's all you, whatever you really is. If you're asking which form I'm more comfortable in, it's great. Wasn't always the case, especially early on. But I can't get rid of her, and unlike Bruce, I don't want to. So why fight it? Changing from Jen to She-Hulk is like coming home and taking your shoes off. Or your bra. But you don't know that feeling. Jen is like a suit you wear to work. She hopes is the most comfortable thing you want. Then as a psychiatrist, I propose you get to work. I'm en route to Judge Halpern's chambers right now. That's why they're on the phone. No, no. You gave me the opportunity to understand that being Jen is work for you. I want to know what that actually does to you emotionally. If you don't address this now, then there's going to come a time where things may not be as carefree and whimsical as you always make them out to be. When you have to get down to serious emotional business, you let all those skills atrophy. Wow. You sound like Lenny. Well, maybe that's because we both have a point. So you're saying I should lawyer with Jen and do the other stuff as she hulk? Well... I would not expect you to put Jen in harm's way. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't care what the settings are. I want you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Okay, now you're back to psycho babble. The point is, it's okay to be comfortable with multiple facets of your personality, even when they're not ideal. You'll notice that the predominant traits may even get a boost that you didn't expect. Fine. All right. I'm in the way. Hold on a sec. Okay, I'm Jen now, and all of a sudden everyone's staring at me in the car. And what's your emotional response to that? If I were green, I'd yell at them to mind their own business. So, refresh my memory. Why can't you do that right now? I suppose I can. Then let's hear it. Hey, uh, hey, buddy. Keep moving. Now, see anyone paying colors before? Good, that's good. Yeah, that did feel good. If you don't move to me, white is the only thing that's going to be green. Wow, sounds like Jen has a little road rage. Oh, that was strangely cathartic. Thanks, Doc. Um, just back to the courthouse. I guess I'll go inside as Jen and see how it goes. 
I think you'll continue to pleasantly surprise yourself. I hope so, because I really to. What's going on? Uh, Doc, that has to go away now. She can't fight Titania like this. Titania, today is not the day. I'm going to pound you into the ground. Doc, I better run. We'll talk soon. Well, that was a first. Hey, man, sometimes phone sessions can really be... Yeah, I I really wish we didn't have to do it that way. Doggone it. Why does she do that? She's a very busy woman and she hasn't got all day. It won't cost much. Just your voice. Poor unfortunate. So- Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, a we didn't, we didn't, yeah, we didn't we didn't have that many sidetracks like that. So I don't, I don't think we did. No, 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 no real uh, tangents. So that's going to wrap it up uh, for this episode. Our next two episodes will be Jason Todd. As requested by uh, Ruby, or I'm sorry, it was requested by Ariel. <laughs> it's funny, <laughs> just singing Little Mermaid, completely unrelated to Ariel. Uh, and uh, Kalidas Cassidy to tie in as Doc is going to be doing another guest column for uh, Adventures in Poor Taste. So you can go to uh, their website and check out his column. At the end of the month, they're doing a whole symbiote week. So we're going to do a Kalidas Cassidy episode to tie in with that. Yay! Should be a lot of fun. We're also, um, we are working on it. I don't have details yet, but we are going to be working on our first ever live recorded episode. Uh, We're going to be doing it in Rogue Comics in Cranford, New Jersey. So uh, once we get an exact date and time, that'll be posted all over social media. And hopefully by the time we record our Jason Todd episode, we'll have a a date and time for that. So you can come out and meet myself and Doc and... uh, ask some questions live. I don't know exactly who it is we'll be doing that day. It all sort of depends on who's coming up on the schedule, but but we will keep you posted. And last but not least for me personally, Friday, September 13th, I will be hosting a charity dinner at George and Martha's in Morristown, New Jersey from four o'clock to close. Any food proceeds, uh, there's a flyer that will be posted on the social media pages and on our website and so on. If you bring that flyer in, 15% of your food tab minus beer and sales tax will go towards Extra Life. And uh, long-term listeners know that Extra Life is a cause that's very near and dear to me. Um, And if you stick around after dinner, dinner will be karaoke night. And what I'm going to say is uh, now this is the first time I'm saying this publicly or at least publicly announcing this. If I raise a thousand dollars by the time the karaoke night rolls around, I will sing a Taylor Swift song at karaoke. Oh, my gosh. That is for for, again, for those longtime listeners, you know how much I hate Taylor Swift. But if I raise a thousand dollars by the time the karaoke portion of that evening rolls around, I will sing a Taylor Swift song. So you can go to extra-life.org. You can search for my name, Anthony Sitko. Donate. All the money goes towards Children's Miracle Network affiliated hospitals in New Jersey. It's Children's Specialized Hospital with 15 locations across North and Central New Jersey. It is the largest pediatric rehabilitation facility uh, in the country, and they do a a ton of good work. This year, we are trying to buy beds for the NICU unit. Uh, So we are trying to buy specialized cribs for the the children that are in NICU at our facilities. And uh, so that's where that money is going towards. So it's all towards good cause, and I'm willing to put aside my, my strong distaste for Miss Swift if it brings in the money because it's not for me. It's for the kids. Anthony Sitko's views of Taylor Swift are purely his own and not a product of Capes on the Couch. Exactly. Uh, last thing I want to say is we got another five star review this time. This one from Jovial Cynic. Uh, quote, I grew up on comic books and I literally learned many important life lessons from relationships to battling with alcoholism and learned that superheroes were written to be human. It's neat to hear psychiatry apply to them. It's almost cathartic as I'd like these heroes to get better. And uh, oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. So thank you, Jovial Cynic. Uh, If you would like your review read uh, out uh, on a future episode, please. uh, If you're listening to basically on iTunes is really the the platform that allows uh, ratings and reviews. But so please leave us a five star rating and review and we will read in a future episode. You can find us on pretty much every platform that offers podcasts, uh, Google Play, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, and PodCoin, where you can actually make money listening to podcasts. And uh, I think that's about going to wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. Doc, anything you want to add? Sometimes it's best to get out of your skin a little bit. I love it. I love these little things that you come up with. So, Ruby, hope we answered a lot of your questions. And as I said, check out the Dan Slot and Charles Soul runs of She-Hulk. They are fantastic. For Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next time. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist 
but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.